Thanks for having us. And um, yeah, today we'll be covering like specific details and kind of weird technical corners that we found ourselves into when trying to port our application to Kubernetes. Uh, generic context, uh, uh, we are in this case not a SaaS provider, so we are basically just providing our, our HPC, HPC solution uh, within, uh, with all its components as a deployable artifact to the customer, which is basically rolling it out uh, within their own environment. And um, yeah, so that we, we don't have generally like super low level access to the cluster to tweak with the feature gates and, and that level of optimization, but still, it's a very high requirement for us to kind of be as lightweight as possible, maintainable, observable as possible, so that we can minimize the most important metric of all, which is the number of calls that we get when they roll out in production. So um, I am Luca Montechiesi. I am senior software engineer for Siemens EDA. Uh, I'm working in with in of, on the integration uh, of our product between, uh, yeah, which is, is called Caliber, uh, which we will we'll be talking about and uh, container and orchestration technologies, and I'm also interested in a bunch of other different things. Okay, thank you, Luca. Uh, my name is Min Cao. Uh, I'm gonna take it from here. Uh, I'm an engineering director at the uh, Siemens EDA, so we work on this project together. I got it started, he did, he did all the great work, so I did nothing afterwards. <laughs> So to get it started off, uh, so we are going to talk about three parts today. So first, I'm going to introduce what is EDA and what, are, what type of uh, HPC workload that we're talking about. Well, not all HPC are built equal. Then I'm going to turn back over to uh, Luca to tell, you, to tell you, you know, how we solve the problem, how we actually enabling our software to run on Kubernetes uh, uh, cluster. So what is EDA? EDA for us stands for design, uh, Electrical Design Automation. Uh, so it's actually a whole category of software. It covers the entire uh, flow from IC design all the way to IC manufacturing, right? So in general, a lot of people say, okay, EDA is a high-performance computing software, which is correct, right? So uh, there is a lot of uh, software that evolved in here, requires a lot of computing resources. Uh, it's actually built, predated uh, Kubernetes exists, and so a lot of this high-intensive uh, workload already actually solve a lot of problems that you may already be familiar with. Uh, so, uh, but not, not all the EDA software are actually equal. So we usually call it front end of line and back end of line. Front end of the line is more design creation. When you had an idea, you create a circuit and then map it to layout. That's what you do front end and design. So there you see a lot of interactive editing. You see data analysis, you, or you run on-demand simulation, for example. Uh, you want to run your Monte Carlo simulation on, uh, uh, on your circuit. So uh, you know, sometimes you can think about, okay, those things mostly can cover with the jobs on Kubernetes. You can just get away from that. Uh, but once you move to the back end, which is basically what we're dealing with, the, uh, the Caliber product line that we have at Siemens EDA, you're talking about a very you know, highly intensive uh, computing, uh, cluster computing, basically, a batch mode uh, job. So you want to launch, launch the job into a cluster and then leave it running. And then you have many different components actually tightly coupled together. So that's the workload we are dealing with. Give you some simple numbers, just an idea. So we're dealing with with, with a single batch job. This is a single batch job. Twenty thousand cores is not unheard of, and um, you know we even hear about uh, like fifty thousand cores, and that's the scale that we're dealing with. One single node, you can t take memory up to one terabyte, and uh, um, so from the component to component burst uh, communication can be ten gigabit per second. So uh, so that is the uh, that is uh, that is the scale for one single batch job that we're dealing with. So th these are batch jobs. So now let's uh, look under the hood what the uh, Caliber looks like. So, uh, you know, for, so ignore the workload manager for now for a moment. Everything else is one single batch job, right? So the user wants to submit this thing into a cluster and then establish all this uh, uh, interconnection between all the components and then leave it running. And usually the job runs uh, from uh, hours to even days. So it's a very long running job. And you have a lot of moving parts. Of course, then uh, you, you, you will think this is sort of all, almost like orchestration by itself. You have the head nodes, which we call primary nodes. You have a bunch of uh, worker nodes, which we call uh, remote nodes. And then you place all the processes on the remote nodes. There are compute processes. That's the number crunching. Uh, there are scheduling processes. That's the, the dynamic load balancing. Try to move the load across all these uh, uh, compute processes. And then you have all the data uh, processes, which facilitate the uh, information exchange between the, all the compute uh, processes and the, uh, serve as a temporary uh, storage. Some of them are fail-safe. 
So if you lose a compute process, you can still crawl along, you get run a little slower, but the, your jobs can still run to finish. But some of them, if you fail, the whole job is done. And uh, not only that, usually our user is very critical on the uh, uh, turnaround time. So you want this to finish as fast as possible, right? So uh, then there is also dynamic adjustments for the uh, resource because computing resource is very scarce. Usually the, uh, the cluster running our software is saturated. So you, if you have a high priority job comes in, you probably want to say, okay, let that job spit out several, some cores so I can squeeze in this job, let it run finish, and then return the core back to that job instead of killing that job all right. Because that job may be already running for a day. I don't want to kill it. I want to keep it crawling for a few hours so my high priority job can go through and then let it pick up speed. So, so all of these, so all of these requirements I elicited down here, these are, are sort of a software problem predated in Kubernetes. Now the problem is how to run these on, on Kubernetes, how to sort of marry this uh, scheduler with Kubernetes scheduler, right? So the, uh, the Kubernetes jobs um, is not gonna really do the work. And so the solution is we build an operator, we create our own CRD, we create our own controller, uh, and we implement all this logic is in there. And of course there is a, a set of you know, challenges that we go, you know, we have to resolve. Okay, so at this point, I'll turn it back to Luke and talk about how we resolve these. Thanks. So, yeah, so the idea is uh, we have this uh, very lightweight piece of software, joking, and we need to move it like uh, on Kubernetes. So, um, for that, we have been facing like many types of problems, and we are going to provide like some solutions that we gave uh, to this problem. So, maybe you will be able to reuse some of those, just till those. Um, so, yeah, the idea here, the first problem to solve here is uh, this workload is composed of many different moving parts, and this has to be, have to be connected uh, at specific internal states. So, um, just to backtrack to the high-level overview, I have a master process, and I have uh, worker processes. We call them uh, primary and remotes. The workers basically compose the distributed computing framework uh, that is being used and leveraged uh, to schedule operations by the master, by the primary. And, uh, by, and I have also different types of remotes. So, and these different types of remotes are basically accepted by the primary only at, this, at a specific internal states. So this means that the application demands a stateful orchestration. Uh, so this means that the operator itself that we are going to develop depends in this kind of reconciliation logic from the application state itself. This is not a common uh, kind of scenario that you generally see for operators. Operators generally are designed to be stateless and idempotent. They basically read from the Kubernetes API the status of the resources. They build their internal status and they take action based on the build and cache the status, right? So we want to fall back to that use case, uh, to that use model. How did we do? We thought about like just mapping, finding a way to map the application state to Kubernetes API. So in that way, we fall back to the standard use model, right? Um, how can we do that? Uh, how could we do this? So basically the idea is uh, we can steal like the concepts of um, what's being done, for example, by the kubelets. Kubelets solves some sort of similar problem. So among like other uh, dozens of functionalities implemented within them. Uh, but the idea uh, is that the kubelet basically controls the container and uh, creation and execution by interacting through the container runtime interface. Uh, so it knows the state of the containers themselves, right? Uh, and this is, not, this, doesn't, this is not information that, that, that comes directly from Kubernetes. It comes from the container engine itself. So whenever is basically aware, becomes aware of, of this state, it takes care of mapping this state to Kubernetes so that this, this state becomes available for all our controllers so that they can trigger reconcile uh, based on, on this information. This is possible because the kubelet is also a Kubernetes client itself. Okay, so it interacts with the API by itself. So can we do something similar? Sure, we can. Uh, we can just create an application which kind of behaves in, uh, in this concern for um, like in a similar way uh, with respect to the kubelet. So this application, we call it a, like a state server. It's just an application that runs as, as a sidecar of our primary process, just scrapes the state and serves the state to the outside world. So that another application, we call it like a state mapper, is able to scrape the state, map it to the Kubernetes API so that all our reconciliation logic can happen in a much more natural um, way. 
So how does it map to the final architecture? So basically, um, we can see here, we have like our stateful primary process. Uh, we have our sidecar container, which is kind of just getting and parsing the state from, um, from the primary. It's exposing the state so that the, the job controller, so it's basically the entity obstructing our whole uh, orchestration for the job, can take action based on that. And it reads the state from the Kubernetes API, right? So the only thing that the job controller has to do is just basically to um, create batches of pods depending on the state of which is read from the Kubernetes API. Uh, I'm saying only, but it's kind of, um, yeah, it, it's kind of, um, um, it, it, I'm, I'm talking small about that because like actually the batch that we, we, we end up creating are a very big scale uh, um, list of objects. So we are talking about like dozens of thousands of pods for every batch that we create. So um, we need to kind of have a little bit of an attention also on this inner uh, control loop because um, yeah, it's very much a problem, can become very much a problem in cluster which are not managed by us. So how can we make this part as light as possible? So, and as efficient as possible, still satisfying the functional requirements. So the first uh, recommendation I could do is, I could give is just, if your use model kind of fits what you need to do, um, you can just use the batch API, uh, just the, the, the native, uh, the native uh, job controller, which is already comes for free, basically in in the Kubernetes API. That has been done like um, an amazing job by the by the batch work group lately. Uh, it supports submitting and scaling up to 10k, uh, 100, yeah, sorry, uh, 100,000 um, pods. So it's very efficient, very flexible, and is trying. The, I, I see the worker is trying to capture as much as possible all the possible HPC AI type of and batch type of workloads. So if it fits, just use this one. In our case, we wanted to hurt ourselves. <laughs> so we wanted to play with the, uh, we wanted to kind of implement at a lower level uh, batch controllers because we wanted to be able to tweak with specific uh, uh, features of the, of, the, um, of, the, um, of the scale up and down, for example, of the, of the pods. Um, one, one, one thing that we wanted to implement, for example, we wanted to be able to when during the scale down of a job, we are talking about like highly dynamic jobs. So these jobs are able to kind of just scale up and down depending on the demand of the primary, which knows the parallelization that it can get to optimize the workload. So basically one thing that we wanted to do, for example, is just to be able to scale down um, the, and remove the pods uh, from the same nodes or for specific nodes. So have control on which nodes we were deleting the pods from so that we could basically empty out some nodes before and they were being able to be reclaimed by the autoscaler before. Well, if we just scale them randomly, like, uh, yeah, we cannot have control on that. So we have fragmentation of the pods across, um, across the, um, the different nodes. Uh, another thing, uh, so we, since we are basically rolling this out at a customer side, we wanted to offload this part of the job, which is kind of a heavy part, kind of moving all these parts from the customer side and just have it within our own domain. So uh, our own package, we, we, can, we can kind of provide observability on that and, and yeah, it becomes so much easier to maintain uh, for us. Um, also implements custom status information and other requirements which are dictated by the manager with it, which is interacting with this component. So. Where did we start? How, what, what did we go? Um, so basically, um, we, didn't, we didn't do anything fancy. Like we, we basically started from the standard kubebuilder scaffolding. Uh, we made use of controller runtime library. Two words on that uh, for people that don't know uh, what it is yet. It's just a library, um, um, which is basically, I, I would say like it's butter included that it, it contains a lot of very useful function for creating very efficiently and very flexibly your own controllers. Uh, you can see the full architecture at the left. The components that we are going to talk about, the ones that we are going to optimize uh, within the next slides, are the ones that you can see on the right. So basically, quick uh, picture on the architecture and how we, this, basically this library interacts with the API server. So I have my API server right in the sky. I have like uh, my, my clients which are sitting within the controller itself. So um, the first component that we're going to watch is the reflector. Reflector just 
as the name says, kind of mirrors the resources that uh, the controller is watching and the, the, that are contained within the um, ETCD and kind of uh, exposed through the API server, right? Um, so to do so, for example, and we are going to focus especially on list and watch requests because those are the heavier ones, especially when you go like 10,000 pods. Those are very heavy when you are dealing with, um, yeah, with, with on, the, on the API server side. Uh, so uh, um, a reflector under the hood is based on a HTTP client, simple standard HTTP client, which keeps open an HTTP2 or WebSocket web, web connection with the API, a, API server so that it can basically keep this channel open and be notified whenever there is a change to any type of watch resource. So um, when this is reflected, where is it reflected? It is reflected within the, uh, a local cache. Uh, the cache is just uh, uh, something, anything that can, you, you can implement your own cache if you want. Um, it's something that implements the informer interface. And uh, yeah, it's just caching, as the name says, uh, the, the changes and the resource itself. And on a downstream to the cache, I can have predicates. So predicates are just filtering functions that you can set up so that you can you can just basically trigger your reconcile logic based on the events that you are actually interested in. So you may just discard the ones that you don't care about. And then you have your reconciler, which is where the magic happens. You basically watch the state and you build a new state and you, you based on the desired state, you decide the actions that you, you may take on the cluster. So just, for example, creating the pods if they are not there. So um, yeah. Simple functionality, but uh, quite complicated architecture. So you want to be able to observe what is going on, right? It's a kind of a sophisticated interaction, this one. And there is not so much uh, information around that we can find about like how to troubleshoot it better. API server side, there is information. It's, there is auditing. You can set it up like very flexibly. Um, yeah, basically you can just discriminate like whatever, specifically what exactly what you want to watch, uh, the pods, uh, like uh, specific verbs. So it's very flexible and very powerful. Server side metrics, there are a ton of server metrics uh, exposed uh, um, through the metric server. Um, so the ones that you generally want to have a look at are the ones related to API priority and fairness. So concurrency limiting use and uh, how much latency your requests are generally taking uh, to get back. So these are kind of the main ones that we have a look at. Client side, um, it's kind of a blurry area. Like we couldn't find so much. So we thought about putting together a slide to talk about that. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, you want to watch exactly which request you are doing to the API server, right? Stupid thing, but what is that you, you do? You turn up logging. So all these libraries, I think also client Go supports, um, is based um, on, on global singleton loggers. So you can just set up the, the verbosity to a, to, to a higher, higher level. Just dump any request. And, and this will basically dump any request or response that your client gets. Uh, one note though, this one dump uh, the actual events, change events that are flowing through the network. Why? Because the, the connection is never closed. So the read closer of the client is never, is never finalizing the body. So you won't be seeing this stuff. How do I get to see this stuff if I want to? Um, the first way you can just hook up after the cache, as we showed, you can implement your own just predicate uh, dump like a predicate function, which just logs all the events. So you can see what is going on after the cache. But if you want to, if you don't trust anybody and you want to have a look at pre-cache what is going on, you can, this is a kind of a hacky approach I know, but it works. You can just uh, tap basically on top of the TCP level at, uh, on the HTTP round tripper. You can implement your own round tripper and just, yeah, just hook up and have a look at everything that is flowing through the network. Clearly, you need to have JSON encoding for that because if you have other stuff or if you have encryption, you, you won't be able to see that. No. Correct. I'm, I'm, I'm going to correct myself. I think this hooks up after the decryption, so you can still be able to see it. Uh, all this stuff was kind of development material, production-wise, metrics. So um, the scaffold, the default QBuilder uh, scaffolding comes for comes with like a lot of um, like a, a Prometheus endpoint, which is serving a lot of interesting metrics for all the levels of the stack that I showed before. So work queue, REST client, and reflector. So you may be able to get really interesting information about what, it go, what is going on to your controller, even in production. So now I have the tools. 
Uh, what do I do with these tools? Definitely not what the lady is doing here. So we got to watch in the right way. Um, how do I do it? Um, first thing, uh, we need to consider we have, so we have a ton of resources, ton of events flowing back and forth around the network. So I want to protect basically, first thing, first thing like the controller from uh, the things that it's, it's not interested about, right? So first thing I can do, I can, for example, uh, set up like the controller itself uh, so that it's only watching the events, sorry, is only reconciling on the events uh, that are concerning uh, to himself, right? I, I'm, I'm kind of just watching a uh, specific type of resources and I'm kind of disregarding anything else. On top of that, I may even, even uh, just reconciling uh, on specific types of resources, I may not be interested in all the types of events. So I may set up predicates that just reconcile on, uh, for example, deletion events or creation events, depending on what my specific application demand is. This is useful, again, for protecting controller from the kind of the wilderness. But how do I protect like the API server from the controller? Because that's another thing. Because the controller itself, when, it, when, when I'm watching and listing 10,000 resources for like a thousand jobs, it may very easily overload the API server. And uh, not all the managed environments are set up to tolerate that amount of, of, of requests, right? So the first thing I, I need to do is just watch at the lower level, so under, uh, before the cache, uh, at the HTTP client level, exactly the resources which are concerning, uh, are, uh, which my, cons uh, my controller cons is concerned about. So uh, I need to basically set up a labeling system that allows me to just uh, watch the label resources that controller uh, needs to be aware of. In this example, I have a pod inside of the name same namespace, which is not, it doesn't have anything to do with the controller itself. Uh, with, the, yeah, with, with my resources as well is kind of a, a part of somebody else. And since it's not labeled, I'm not watching it. So easy, but like powerful. And this thing is also powerful if we want to go like in advanced functionality. And for example, I want to implement operator sharding. Just imagine, just imagine that my co controller sharding better. So just imagine my controller itself is only watching a subset of resources or one instance of the controller, while another controller is watching another subset. And these sets are basically labeled with indexes. So I can implement pretty advanced functionality and we are thinking about like putting some work on that as well. Uh, even more extreme, uh, I'm not interested, I may not be interested in the actual status of my, of my child pods. So I may just be interested with the, in the fact that they are there. Or like, uh, yeah, for example, I can get the status of the job from the, pro the primary process, right? So in that case, I can set up, I can go even a longer way and I can just watch the metadata of these pods. And this ends up saving quite a lot of uh, bandwidth on the network as well. So it's, uh, my point was just like, it's extremely uh, flexible and configurable. And uh, yeah, just dig like the source code because there are a ton of hidden functionality which are not readily available when you read the docs some, sometime. Um, so that said, uh, assuming you kind of implement all these optimizations, um, you still, I may have a problem because you have you still have like a ton of pods within the cluster and the, the thing that I want to say is like you're you may not be the only one watching so you may have like CNI controllers you may have uh, mutating web hooks that every time that you roll out you, you create a pod or a new resource basically are triggered and are, are basically managed by somebody else so you are, th there is always this underlying assumption that somebody else is doing a good job at kind of managing all this stuff right um, so what, you can, what, what, what could we do to basically um, make, make this thing lighter, right? Um, and and more, more efficient. So we thought about like, uh, our pod for us is just an abstraction of a computing unit uh, within our, our, or, uh, our whole job. So can we just make this computing unit uh, bigger? So can we just pack multiple workers, for example, within the same pod and still get the same functionality? So functionally, clearly this works. And also this thing ends up saving quite a lot of bandwidth. Uh, so at the, at the right, you can see the watch, uh, the, the watch bandwidth, which was consumed through a whole, um, yeah, through a whole kind of a creation of, I think, 10, 10 key workers here. Uh, so we end, we, we end up saving like as much as four times more, more bandwidth by packing like four, four remotes inside of the same container and the same pod. Clearly, 
you may say, okay, this is not without any consequence. So clearly uh, the pod itself becomes bulkier. Um, the failure modes for, um, the failure conditions for these pods become harder to, to basically set up because like what if just one, one, one worker fails, what do I need to do? Do I, I need to get the whole pod to fail? So these kind of things become a little bit more complicated but still manageable if you want to. The thing that doesn't become so much easier is the scheduling itself because we are talking about like um, pretty bulky uh, processes. So if you basically pack many, many of these processes within a, within a single pod and you clearly have to rise the requests, you make the scheduling less efficient and a little bit more complicated. So for example, we have seen that after three, four workers inside of the same, um, the same container, the same pod, um, and the same pod, uh, we start to basically see degradations in the scheduling efficiency, okay? This is clearly dependent on, on, on a number of factors, but this is what we've seen. Um, so yeah, with these things, we basically have kind of optimized a little bit anything we could to make uh, this bulky workload a little bit lighter to part and to move across the clusters. Uh, what, what is the user experience for the, for the user itself? How does it submit the job? So as expected, it, we, they have a job, um, um, a job resource. Um, one thing is like since it's kind of composed of different type of, uh, of remotes, this may be may become a little bit too verbose. Like imagine like you have a bulky uh, YAML spec. Okay, it's nice that it's uh, just uh, plug and play. You, you just submit it and it creates everything, but it's really a big, big thing. So we thought about like kind of using, um, and this is uh, something that we came up to with, actually like a very interesting model where you basically can have a specific section of the YAML, which is kind of a common base. And then like you have other subsections specific to all the types of pod that basically inherit and override this section. So we kind of played with the YAML a little bit and the result is something a little bit more, is kind of still super expressive, but kind of uh, a little bit uh, smaller to manage and easier to read uh, as well. And at the same time, we kept the possibility to just inject uh, sidecar containers um, freely so that we and the customer itself is able to just extend the functionality and, and make it much more uh, extensible in general. Uh, performance wise, we have doing test, we've been doing tests across all our products. Uh, unsurprisingly, we had like parity of performance. One thing that you, want, you may wanna be aware of is that when we started to play with kind of uh, security features, so for example, there is this CCOM default uh, feature of uh, the kubelets that basically just enables CCOM uh, functionality. CCOMP is a syscall filtering uh, functionality that happens right at the border of the kernel. Um, when we enabled that, we got a substantial performance degradation on specific workloads. The reason is, and this wasn't definitely easy to find out, on specific operating systems and specific kernel versions, uh, basically CCOMP is tied to uh, another um, security mitigation functionality, which is called SDIBP, which is sp uh, speculative star bypass. So whenever that one is enabled, basically the branch prediction capabilities of the processor between logical cores in, in SMT um, functionality is basically disabled. So this means that very CPU intensive workloads end up having like quite substantial performance degradation. Even worse, uh, this functionality, um, I take, take me for granted, but like verify this, but it, it should be enabled by default after Kubernetes 1.27. So if you are seeing running kind of computing intensive applications and seeing performance degradations, this may be the reason, just have a look at that. Um, so last thing uh, we wanna cover because we cover much of the lower level of our stack. This is a pretty much a work in progress, but the uh, direction that we are uh, we, are, we really wanna follow. So um, how do we, basically, okay, I, I managed to have my workload to run on Kubernetes in a lighter way and, and, and so on and so forth, but how do I enable multi-tenancy with respect to the resources which sits under my workload? So we are basically working to integrate with a project called Q, and Q has two very nice features. The first one is that um, it doesn't touch anything concerning the scheduling. So it's just something that you can install on top and you can basically manage your quotas and your resources on top of what is already existing. The other one is that it's, it's exposing a, 
very generic uh, uh, workload uh, customer source that you can basically use as an interface so that you can announce your workload type to, to Q. And Q will be able to just, uh, you will just be able to use the full functionality. So your controllers just have to announce to create like this workload resource whenever you, you, you receive, um, you are reconciling a job. And uh, Q will take care of just taking the admission decision if it will be uh, basically admitting the workload to, to, to your Q or not. Um, yeah, functionally, you can just label like your, your resources as, as uh, your nodes as different resource flavors, and you can map them out to a cluster queue, and you can basically map your kind of organization, your teams to specific local queues, which are basically resource managed against the cluster queue and um, the quota values that you decide to set. Uh, so yeah, this basically covers uh, pretty much the work that we, uh, that we have done. There is really a lot of other uh, smaller details that we don't have the time to talk about. Uh, but yeah, so I think this basically covers uh, pretty much what we did. So thanks for the attention span and yeah, hopefully the last session uh, will be. Yeah, I think we have time to take questions. So yep. there is a mic in the center. Is this integrate uh, with traditional scheduling systems like Slurm or PBS in any way? So um, basically, um, let's say Q is exactly is, is not exactly a replacement. It's something you can use with uh, um, the, um, the, the um, with some existing schedulers. Okay, uh, but like there is some definitely some overlap in the functionality. Uh, we actually came to know like about like other uh, projects that make use of Slurm and party to Kubernetes as well. Uh, but those ones are basically something that kind of were, was, was born outside and brought inside of Kubernetes. Well, Q, the nice thing is kind of is conceived from the start, very close uh, from a, a work group, which is very close to the Kubernetes API itself. So, and uh, it doesn't touch the scheduling layer at all. So it just in installs on top. So we are specifically work on that, working on that, but we definitely have plans to investigate also like a Slurm on Kubernetes use model because some of our customers yeah, may so that's, definitely demand of You know, because this, uh, the software exists a long time ago, right? So there are a lot of people use uh, the old um, resource management software, right? So like uh, LSF, Grid Engine, uh, Slurm is uh, relatively new, but it's more of the same use model. So we, we are also keep the, keeping that in mind, and does it make sense to just drop the Slurm on top of Kubernetes and you live in Slurm? Well, th that was a question that actually came up during yep. the uh, development. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Cool. cool. Uh, right. So if there are no other questions, you, you can find us around yeah, for so we'll be around. the big party after anyways. Yeah. So just feel free to reach out. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you.